Welcome to the Larry Lewis Ministries. I'm Larry Lewis, pastor of Potter's Church here at Cave In Rock, Illinois. We want to welcome you today to a very important teaching concerning the book of Revelation. We're going to take a literal walk through the 22 chapters of the book of Revelation. We're going to read the scripture today from the book of Revelation, chapter 22, John's writing, in verse 18 through 21. These scriptures cause me to tremble as I read them, the final verses of our Bible. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And may God add his blessing under this message today. The Apostle John is the author of the book of Revelation. He is the son of Zebedee and Salome. He was one of the inner circle with Peter and James. He wrote the Gospel of St. John. Then he wrote the three epistles in the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Then John, at a later time in his life, went to the city of Ephesus in modern-day Turkey, became the pastor there, the church that Paul had founded. He became the bishop over several different churches in that area, and in the time of Demetrius, the Roman emperor, he was banished to an isle called the Isle of Patmos, about 20 miles off the coast of Ephesus. He was incarcerated there because of his testimony that Jesus Christ was Lord. He says while he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, that he heard a voice behind him, and the Lord spake unto him to preach this final message, the book of Revelation. John says a message came from God, given to the Lord Jesus Christ, and then given to an angel, who Revelation 19, Revelation 22, became a prophet, was a prophet that lived at one time upon the earth. The book sends greetings from God, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty, and from the seven spirits before his throne, which could dictate either the Holy Spirit or also the seven angels of God's presence, and then from the Lord Jesus Christ, who it depicts as a prophet, priest, and king. He came as a prophet, he's now our high priest, and he's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. John says while he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, he heard the voice behind him as the sound of a trumpet and also as the sound of many waters. When he turned around there in that prison cell, he began to look up and he saw the Lord Jesus Christ in the robe of the high priest. He had on a white linen garment. He was girded about the path of the golden girdle, the breastplate of the high priest. His feet was like brass that had been baked in the oven. He had seven stars in his right hand. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His head and hair was white like wool, and his eyes were like fire. And when John saw him, he fell down before him as dead. And the Lord Jesus laid his right hand upon him and said, Fear not, John, I am he that was alive and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell, or the grave and Sheol, or Hades. And he said, I'll give you the understanding of this mystery. He said the seven candlesticks, he said, typify the seven churches of Asia. And he said that the seven, the seven stars typify the angels that were assigned to those churches or perhaps could have been the pastors. And he was so told to write seven letters to the seven churches of Asia. The church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These churches depict the church from the day of Pentecost until Christ comes back for the rapture and then the setup of his kingdom at the great battle of Armageddon. Seven times the Lord spoke to these churches. He said, I know thy works. Absolute knowledge of the church and everyone involved inside of the church. And seven times he said, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said of the church. And seven times he promised them a blessing. Each church, a different individual blessing to those that overcome he promised the church of Ephesus they would overcome. He would give them right to the tree of life. He told the church of Smyrna if they would overcome, they would not have to suffer the second death. The church of Pergamos, he told them to overcome. He'd give them a white stone with a new name written that was special for each individual who received it. The church of Thyatira, he promised them to overcome that they could rule over the nations of the earth with a rod of iron. He promised the church of Sardis and overcome that he would not blot their name out of the book of life. 
the church of Philadelphia. He said, you know, overcome, I'll keep you from our temptation or trial, the seven-year tribulation period, that's going to come up on this earth. The church of Laodicea, he promised those that overcome, said he that as he overcame and sat down before his father in his throne, that they that overcome could sit with him in his millennial throne when he comes back to reign for 1,000 years. We want to take just a brief look through these seven churches because a very important message found in these churches. Now there were several churches there in that area that John was over, but he picked out these seven because what happened inside of these churches at that time would be relative to what would take place in the church from the time that Christ left and he comes back for Armageddon. Each individual had a parallel with what was happening there at that particular time. The church of Ephesus was the early church, the apostolic church. The Lord commended them because they tried those that said they were prophets or apostles and found them to be large and false prophets. He warned them and told them that he saw that they come against the Nicolaitans and tried to overthrow the laity. They set up a priestly order. But he said, I have somewhat against you because he said you've lost or left your first love, that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He told them except they repented, he would withdraw the candlestick, the Holy Spirit or the angel or the pastor that was assigned over to the church at that particular time. He said, if you overcome, I'll give you right to the tree of life. The tree of life is found in the book of Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve were driven from the garden and God put the great angels there turning each way, all four ways direction to keep them to coming back inside of paradise. But Jesus would come down upon the cross when the veil would split, we have access now back in the very presence of the Almighty God. And the Lord spoke to the church of Smyrna, the persecuted church, from the time of Nero down through the Clethian, all the way down to about 314. Nero, in one week's time, put 100,000 Christians to death. Among them was Apostle Paul and Peter. When the Colian came to the throne in 303, the emperor of Rome, he made it against the law for anybody to be a Christian. And he put about 10 million saints of God to death because of their faith and testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus talked to those people in that era, if they would overcome and suffer unto death, that he would give them a crown of life and said, but you'll not have to suffer the second death. Now, natural death is a separation of the spirit, soul, and spiritual body from the natural death, from the natural body. But also we know that in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, chapter 20, when John looks and sees the great white throne and the judgment of God of Satan, fallen angels, and demons, and all wicked of mankind stand before him, he said that the book of life is open. And their names are not found in the book of life. And anybody whose name was not found in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. And John said that this is the second death. Second death. If they endure to the end, they not have to suffer the second death. The church of Pergamos was a married church under Constantine that attacked the city of Rome, became the emperor of Rome. But he didn't did what was spoken here in this particular part of the book of Revelation concerning Pergamos. He said that he did what was called Balaam. Baalism. Balaam in chapter 24 of Numbers was a prophet that coincided, went along with paganism, polytheistic religions, began to bring those false doctrines of other religions out of Babylon inside the church. That's what Constantine done. Began to bring those false doctrines inside the church. But the Lord spoke out of that church era and he said they to overcome. He said, I'll give you a white stone and a new name written. The white stone was given to those Olympic winners and the new name, and there's the name that we will have, a new name that we'll have, not only in the rapture in the kingdom, but also inside the holy city, New Jerusalem. The next church was the church of Thyatira. Thyatira meant feminine oppression. It was a time when he spoke about a man with the name of Ahab and Jezebel. We know that Ahab and Jezebel didn't live in this time, but what was happening inside the church was symbolic of what happened with Ahab and Jezebel. When Ahab went out and married the daughter of the Zidonians, and she was a priestess of Baal and brought her in. That's what happened to the Roman Empire at that time. They went out and Roman Catholicism was arising. In the time of the first of Caesars, it was called the Popes. They began to do spiritual fornication. Baalism began to come inside the church. And the Lord spoke and said, it's like this. So that it's be like a heart that will be in a bed. And if anyone go in and lay with her, he said, I will bring great persecution upon them. Spiritual fornication, the Lord was talking about. A period of about 1260 years when nearly 60 million people were put to death by the Roman church and also by the Roman government in that time. But the Lord said to them that overcome, 
He said, he said, if you overcome, he said, I'll let you rule the earth with me with a rod of iron and promise them the morning star. The church of Sardis was the church under Martin Luther, the Reformation, the early 1500s. And the Lord spoke about that church and he said to them, said, that their works was not perfect before him. He talked about the white robe. They didn't have on the white robe, which talked about righteousness and purity before God. Because Martin Luther had many things on his side, but he was also a person that hated the Jews. And the Lord said to that church area, he said, he that overcometh, I will not blot your name out of the book of life. You can do many things for the Lord, but if you turn away from him in apostasy and fornication, you can have your name blot out of the book of life. Now the next church is the church of Philadelphia. That's the church that come along in about the 1700s with John Wesley, Charles' his brother, one of the most powerful forces on the, on the face of the earth. As a Methodist church began to rise up, another church that began to take the gospel to the nations of the world. But the Lord began to speak of that church, and we're living in that church now. He talked about those that said they were Jews of the synagogue of the synagogue of God, and but and that they were Jews. But he said they're liars. He was talking about the Jews that rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Jews in this last day, many have still rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. He said, "I will cause him to come and bow down before your feet." I believe that God in this last day is getting ready to raise up a great people and the word of God is going to go forth like never before, before the rapture of the church. And I believe that Israel is going to begin to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been cut off for 2,000 years and the gospel is like the sun and it rises in the east and sets in the west and goes back up to the east. The gospel started with the Jews. It's come to the Gentile. It's getting ready to go back to the Jews in this last day. The church of Philadelphia. And the Lord promised them that would keep his patience, keep his word under the end, that he would keep them, keep us from that great trial period of temptation that's of seven years that's going to come up on this earth, the rise of the Antichrist, the manifestation of the Antichrist that will consummate the great battle of Armageddon. He said, I'll write upon you the name of my Father and the name of the holy city of Jerusalem, and I'll write upon you my name. Now that new Jerusalem is talking about the new Jerusalem comes down to Revelation chapter 22. Inside the new Jerusalem, the, king, the bride lives inside the city. The kings of the earth bring their glory into it to save the nations walk in the light of it. He's talking about the elders being raptured out. Any harvest has the first fruits, or first rites, and then the main harvest, and then the gleanings. The bride will be taken out at the rapture of the church. Right here in this church, standing right over here, sitting at a table right over here, I saw an angel of the Lord. And he was sitting at the table and looking at the, looking at the paper, moving the paper, looking at the paper, moving the paper. He had a big stamp. He would stamp it. He would turn over and click. And I walked over and there's names of people up on those papers. And he was stamping disqualified. People disqualified for the rapture. It don't mean you're not going to go to heaven. It doesn't mean you might not be a part of the kingdom. It might not be you uh, would not be in the new heaven and the new earth. It just simply means you're not qualified to be in the rapture of the church. We're living in that period right now when the Lord is soon to come for His bride. The next day of the church, the Laodicean church. It's a lukewarm church, he said. He said, I wish you either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of a mile. He said, I want you to go out and purchase of me gold tried in the fire. The church in this last day needs to raise up with the Antichrist and the false prophet coming, begin to move forth in this last day against harlotry and spiritual fornication inside the church and blasphemy coming forth from some of the leaders we have in our nation today. Now the Lord spoke about that church as a lukewarm church. He said, you say that you're, you say that you're on fire, you say that you're rich and have need of nothing. But he said, you're spiritually poor, you're spiritually blind, and you're spiritually naked. Now the Lord said to the overcomers of that church era, He said to those who overcome as I overcame and sat with my Father in His throne, you that overcome, you can sit with me in my millennial throne. Now chapter 4 is the rapture of the church. When John hears a, a voice that's like a sound of a trumpet that says, come up here to where I am. And immediately becomes in the spirit. He's called up to the third heaven. To the new Jerusalem. And he sees the throne of God. And 24 elders sitting upon that throne. He, hear, he hears that voice. And immediately becomes changed. Called up to heaven. The trumpet. In 1 first, first Corinthians 15. It talks about verse 28. How that they will not all be asleep. And not everybody will be dead when the Lord comes. But we'll all be changed. He said in a moment. In the trumpet. The sounding of the last trumpet. When the dead in Christ would rise, and he's talking about there'd be a moment in the twinkle of an eye. In 1 
First Thessalonians chapter 4, 15 through 18 said, The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ would, be, would rise first, and we remain will be caught up to heaven to meet them at that meeting in the air. I believe we're all looking forward to the rapture of the church. He sees the 24 elders sitting up on seats around God's throne. Literally from Hebrews talking about 24 thrones that will reign with God. He sees the seraphims. He sees the hachmah, which from Hebrew means to be silent and speak. When God speaks, they're silent. When, when, God, whenever God, when God doesn't speak, then they begin to speak. He looked and saw them cast the angels, or the, the raptured saints, the elders, cast their crown before the Lord. And then in Revelation chapter 5, he sees one of the elders. He's got this book, scroll, written on both sides. And he said within, he said, no man in heaven and earth was able to open those seals, or open that scroll, and see what was written upon there, and to bring forth the kingdom of Christ. And John began to weep because nobody was able to open up. And the elder said, don't weep, John. Don't cry, John. He said, the lion of the tribe of Judah had prevailed to open this book. And John looked to see the lion of the tribe of Judah. He saw a lamb, Christ, that had been slain, standing up, resurrected. Jesus came as the lamb. He soon to come back as the lion. Then it goes into Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 starts the seven-year tribulation period. With the coming forth of the white horse. And Christ opens up the seal. And the white horse comes forth. It's the Antichrist. It's come forth of peace and flatteries. He comes forth of peace and flatteries. He comes forth in deception. Riding upon a white horse. Then the Bible speaks about how that there come forth a red horse. A red horse of war. The Antichrist comes forth as a man of peace. Makes a covenant with Israel for seven years. And then the red horse of war comes forth. Same rider. The Antichrist just moves over to fight against those that come against him. And then the black horse comes forth. And the black horse is a black horse of famine after the war. And then the pale horse is because of death, because of pestilences or diseases. And then in the fifth seal, he looks and he sees the souls under the altar that have been slain as the middle of the tribulation comes and the mark of the beast and the antichrist is the abomination of desolation. That's the same thing in chapter Matthew 24 when Jesus talked about the seven-year tribulation period. He said, many would come in my name saying, I'm Christ. That's the Antichrist. He said, there'll be wars. That's the red horse. He said, there'll be famines. That's the black horse. He said, there'll be pestilence. That's the pale horse. And then he said, then shall they deliver you up. That's the time of trouble. It's when you see this, the, spoken, the abomination spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. He said, look for these things that come. Begin to flee to the hills. Back to Revelation. Back to the Revelation. We're talking there in Revelation chapter 6. The white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse. And then the sixth seal is opened up. And under the sixth seal, the heaven begin to roll back and forth. And begin to fall. Stars begin to fall as untimely figs from the tree. The signs in the heaven of the Lord's coming. And many begin to run the rocks in the cave and cry out for the mountains to fall upon them. And then Revelation chapter 7. Just before Armageddon, John sees 144,000 of the Jewish people sealed. Then he looks and sees a multitude, a multitude that no man could number, standing before the throne of God in heaven there. Then in chapter 7, chapter 8, John looks and he sees a scene in heaven. He sees an angel there with a golden censer in heaven. Now that angel is none other than our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that golden censer was used on the day of atonement, on the day of Yom Kippur. He would take the, the incense, put it in this golden censer, and go in and offer incense. And there was Jesus in heaven, just after the taking of the main harvest of the church, in the heaven as our high priest, and then seven angels come forward, just before Armageddon. Seven angels come forward, they're given seven trumpets. They begin to sound there in Revelation chapter 8. The one, two, three, and four. And then chapter 9. John looks and sees a star fall from heaven. Well, it's not, a, it's not Satan. It's not Satan. It's an angel of the law that comes rapidly down from heaven. He's given the key to the bottomless pit. He opens up that bottomless pit under the sounding, uh, under the sounding of the, the fifth angel. When the old bottomless pit is opened up, here comes these locusts forth. They've got the body of a horse. They've got the, the head and face of a man. They've got the hair of a woman and the teeth of a lion and the tail of a scorpion. 
And they have a great angel over them who's the angel out of the bottomless pit. His name from the Hebrew is Abaddon. From the Greek, his name is Apollyon. And the Bible says then that a voice speaks from heaven. And the sixth trumpet, the sixth trumpet begins to sound. And the voice says, the angel says, loose those four angels that are bound there in the Euphrates River. It said they're bound there for an hour and for a day and for a month and for a year. And they're bound there to be loosed and to bring in the kings of the east. And one third of the world's population will be, will be killed at the battle of Armageddon. That is the book of Revelation chapter 9. In Revelation chapter 10, it looks and shows an angel standing. And he's clothed with a cloud. And the rainbow, that's deity, under, it, oh, under his feet, he's got uh, clothed with a rainbow. And his head and feet are like pillars of fire. And he stands there with one foot up on the land, one foot up on the sea. He's got that seven seal book. It's open here now. And he swears by God that liveth forever and ever that time shall be no longer. The same angel, the Lord Jesus Christ, the message of the covenant in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, when Daniel was asking, has heaven seen the abomination of desolation? He said, how long will it be the time of abomination of desolation, the end of all things? And the Lord standing up on the Tigris River, with an angel on each side of the bank, he lifted up his hands to heaven and swore by God that they would ever and ever that it would be a times, time, and a dividing of time. Here, Jesus, as the angel of the Lord, says there will be time no longer. That is Revelation chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 11, it talks about the two prophets to be slain, be resurrected three and a half days later. But then the seven trumpet sounds. It's the seven trumpet sound, the latter part of Revelation chapter 11. And it says the kingdom of the world have become the kingdom of Christ. That is, that is the battle of Armageddon right there. And that ends that sequel from Revelation chapter 1 all the way down to Revelation chapter 11. And it goes back and becomes a twofold prophecy, starting out at the same time in Revelation chapter 4, the rapture, coming through the tribulation, coming down to the battle of Armageddon. But then it goes into the kingdom and the coming down of the holy city of New Jerusalem. Now what happens in Revelation chapter 7 Revelation chapter 14 are identical the same time. The multitudes and also the going, the Gentiles, is exactly the same time. Now listen to me carefully. We're not going to do deep detail, too deep of the detail on this subject right here. And we're limited for our time. But John, in Revelation chapter 12, he looks and sees a sign or a wonder in heaven. He sees a woman clothed with the sun, and under her feet she's got the moon. And the woman has a crown up on her head, and she's got ten stars inside that crown. And the woman is clothed with the sun. Now this woman typifies the church. It typifies the, the second, second Eve. Now, Paul speaks in the book of 1 Corinthians that we had our first man, Adam, that brought death, and the first Eve. But now he says, Christ is the second man, Adam, and the church is the second woman, Eve. Now, God wanted Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. It didn't work. But God, through Jesus Christ, the second man, Adam, and through his bride, will literally populate the earth. Because she is the second Eve. And nobody can go to heaven except they come through Christ. And through the second, second lady Eve, which is the church. The woman is pregnant. She brings forth the man child. Now I want you to notice that this light she's clothed with, the, the law is typified by the moon. And the light she's clothed with is the light of the gospel. Jesus Christ being the light of the world. And the twelve stars in the crown typify the twelve apostles of the New Testament church. Now, in Revelation chapter 4, it talks about the 24 elders. 24 is the number of the bride. 24 is the number of the bride. When you read about that, and you see the 24 elders around the throne of God. That's the bride. When you look at Revelation chapter 21, when the new Jerusalem comes down, it's called the bride. It's just got 12 foundation stones, the name of the 12 apostles of Christ. It's got 12 gates, the name of 12 tribes of Israel, 12 and 12. That's 24, the bride. 24, the bride. Now the reason the 12 names of the apostles is on the foundation stone and not the 12 tribes of Israel because the foundation of the Old Testament church is in the New Testament church. Amen. So we need to realize it today that the sun cold woman brings forth the man child. That man child is the bride of Christ that's coming forth here in this last day 
to stand up against this great red dragon that appears there with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Right in the midst of havoc, spiritual fornication in America and across the nation of the world and coming forth that many people are turning away from the gospel of Christ, committing fornication with other nations, God's going to bring forth his bride in this final revival. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul spoke about the coming of the Lord for the battle of Armageddon for the kingdom, said it will not come until come, there will come a gathering, that's a rapture, and there come an apostasy or a falling away. We're seeing that right now. But he said there will be something come forth. He called it a he that would withhold the Antichrist. Amen. And the false prophet until he will be revealed in his time, not his time when he wants to, Satan, but when God allows him to come forth. Amen. And begin to come against the saints there. The woman brings forth the man child. Now, when the woman brings forth the man child, this great red dragon's got seven heads and ten horns, and he's got seven crowns upon the heads. Now, those heads and horns represent the seven kingdoms under Satan that's come against Israel from the beginning in sequel. The Egyptian, the Syrian, the Babylonian, the Medo Persian, the Greek, and the Roman, then the Roman Empire of the Vice. Now you can tell by look at this that the seven crowns upon the seven heads and that means it's not in the time of Rome when it comes, it's in the time of revised Rome. And right now we're getting ready to see a first permanent president, when I call the United States of Europe or the United States of, the United States of Europe, begin to come and be given a permanent office. Then the rapture can take place. But the man child is brought forth. He comes against Satan. He comes against everything that Satan's got. He fights this great battle, then we're caught out of here. And then it said that the man-child is taken to the God's throne. Now listen, but the woman, the church, goes into the wilderness for 1,260 days or three and a half years. Revelation chapter 17 shows her in total, complete apostasy. When he sees a woman over there, riding this clothed in purple and scarlet, come from the hill of the city of Rome that's got seven hills, and she's riding up on the back of, of a beast that's got seven heads and ten horns. That woman typifies the church, the Roman church, and also the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, and also becomes the hold of the cage of every unclean spirit of devils and demons as all these other religions begin to come together in apostasy in the first part of the tribulation period. Now back to chapter 12, when the man-child is brought forth, Stands against the Antichrist. He's caught out. The woman goes into the wilderness. Notice for 1260 days. That's three and a half years. Then Revelation chapter 13. Three and a half years later. Right in the middle of the tribulation period. John down chapter 13. Sees a beast come up out of the sea. That's got seven heads. And ten horns. And this time ten crowns up on the horns. Because it's moved from the seven heads. Up to the ten crowns. As the Antichrist revised the Roman Empire. It says he looks in them, and this beast is like a lion, like a bear, like a leopard. That's the same thing as Daniel chapter 7. He sees the beast come up out of there. And this beast has got ten horns. Daniel chapter 7 looks and sees another little horn rise up, the Antichrist, the great orator that speaks forth and does great things. And he said he sees this beast come forth. And said this beast it talks about him that he's given 40 and 2 months. That's three and a half years. Also 1260 days. Three and a half years. Time, time, dividing time. That's three and a half years. He sees one of the heads of this beast that was wounded. Now it was a head. It's a kingdom. It's the revived Roman Empire. It's not a horn. It's not the Antichrist. Somebody teaches that the Antichrist is going to be resurrected by Satan. God have mercy. Satan doesn't have that power. But the Antichrist is given 40 and 2 months, 3 and a half years, the last part of the tribulation period, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And then John looks and sees another beast come up out of the earth. And this beast is a two-horned beast. It looks like a ram, but the ram typifies Christ. But whenever it speaks, it speaks like a dragon. Now it's going to be the vicar of Christ that will claim to be Christ, that will come forth and hide behind the cross. And be given all the power, it said, of that first beast, the Antichrist. And it come to pass that no man were able to be able to buy or sell except to receive the mark of the beast. When you read about the mark of the beast from the Hebrew, we know there's 22 letters. And they're all consonants. And the last letter is Tav. Now, the letters have individual signification like Gimel. It looks like a camel. Tav. In older times, it signified a cross because it looked like a cross. 
the false prophet will come forth looking like Messiah, look like a Messiah, look like a great man of God or the Lord, but when he speaks it's a dragon and no man can find himself except to receive the mark of the beast. Then we go into Revelation chapter 14 and John looks there and when he looks, he sees 144,000 standing on heavenly Mount Zion with the name of God in their foreheads. That's the exact same thing in Revelation chapter 7 when it talks about this 144,000 and then another, another multitude. Then it comes forth with the trumpets. Then it comes forth at Armageddon, Revelation chapter 11. Here, right at the end of the tribulation period, it shows this 144,000, the main harvest, resurrected just before the coming forth of the Antichrist, just before the coming forth of Christ in the battle of Armageddon. Then he looks. He sees that same multitude, Revelation chapter 7. He sees one like the Son of Man riding upon a white horse. And an angel comes down from heaven and says, Thrust in your sickle and harvest the harvest of the earth, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he reaches out and gathers in what I would call the goyim, us Gentiles, and brings us into the fold. Then the angel says, Thrust in thy sickle and harvest the vine of the earth, or those of Satan's father, the Antichrist, and cast them into tribulation. Revelation chapter 14, verse 20. They're cast in there, and blood comes out of the horse and rivals. Then Revelation chapter 15, it's the same thing as the trumpets there in the book of Revelation chapter 8. Same bit thing happens in this period of time almost exactly as it does in Revelation chapter 8 there. Now listen to me carefully. He looks there in the book of Revelation. We've talked the book of Revelation now. We've talked through chapter 14, chapter 15. Now we're getting ready to come down to the opening of the, of the seven vials and seven plagues, Revelation chapter 15. Same as the trumpets, Revelation chapter 8. He sees seven angels come forward, begin to open up seven vials. There were seven plagues. When it gets right down there to the sixth plague, right down to the sixth plague, then it looks, and then when the sixth plague is opened up, he looks up there and he sees three unclean spirits like frogs. Come out of the mouth of the dragon, Satan. Out of the mouth of the Antichrist, the false prophet. And also the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan. And these come forth, evil spirit, to gather forth the armies of the world in for the battle of Armageddon. Now notice that. And it said the Euphrates these rivers dried up. That's exactly the same thing there in the book of, that book of Revelation chapter 9. When the angel comes down and looses those angels, they're, they're bound in Euphrates River, and they go in and gather these armies in for Armageddon. Here in Revelation chapter 16, under the sixth seal, the, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan, the spirits come out of them and gather them in for Armageddon. There it goes down and speaks there about the battle of Armageddon, Armageddon, the Hebrew Hars, mountain, the mountains of Midigo. They're gathered in there for the great battle there in the book of Revelation chapter 16. Now, Revelation chapter 17, this inserted chapter, talks about the woman right up on the back of the beast, the great dragon. And chapter 18 shows the fall of secular and ecclesiastical Babylon. But then chapter 19, it's under the seventh seal, it shows that the marriage supper in heaven. When Christ is married to his church in heaven, and then after his marriage to his church in heaven, he comes forth on a great white horse for the battle of Armageddon. He's got a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. His, his vesture is dipped in blood. And he brings his armies of heaven with him for Armageddon. Why he comes there in the book of Zechariah 14. When Gog and Magog and these nations from the east gathered into the demonic hordes coming to Jerusalem, take the city of Jerusalem, half of it, the Lord will appear above the Mount of Olives with his bride with him to reign for a thousand years. It says there in Revelation chapter 19 that the buzzards, the vultures, be gathered in the feet upon the bodies and the blood of those. Ezekiel 39 talks about the exact same thing. Christ comes from Armageddon. It goes on and says then that the Antichrist or the beast and the false prophet are taken and cast the lake of fire. Well, we know the beast in Daniel chapter 7, the Antichrist, come before the judgment of God. There in the book of Daniel chapter 7, also Matthew 25, when the judgment of the nations and Satan and his angels and demons and the Antichrist, his brother beast, is brought before the throne of God in Jerusalem there. And he's judged. And the Bible says he's judged because of the things that he says. What you say, friends, will be a whole lot different than what you don't say. But there in Revelation chapter 9, chapter, chapter 16, we're talking about Revelation chapter 
Help me tonight. I'll get this through this thing just like wants to go back. We're talking about Revelation and the great battle of Armageddon there in Revelation chapter 19. When Satan is taken, the false prophet is taken. Then it looks in Revelation chapter 20. And John looks and he sees Satan taken by angel of the Lord and bound for a thousand years. For the millennial reign, a thousand years. Isaiah 25, Isaiah 24, Isaiah 13 speaks about how the, the wicked will be taken and the angels and de demons and Satan will be bound for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. Then Revelation chapter 20 speaks about in the first seven verses, it mentioned the millennial reign, the thousand year reign, six times. How that Christ will sit up on his throne there in Jerusalem. Talks about the holy oblation, Ezekiel 40 through 48. How it'll be lifted up a supernatural mountain, Isaiah chapter 2. It'll be a 50 mile square, the old holy oblation. The northern part of it, the 20 mile square for the Levites. The, the middle part of it where the temple will stand, the one mile square temple that Christ will reign after the old will stand in the center. Then it talks about the healing water flowing out to Jerusalem and down to the Mediterranean Sea to the, and down to the Dead Sea. It talks about the city of Jerusalem, the 10 mile square, and Christ will reign from that oblation for a thousand years as King of Kings and Lord of Lords with His bride, His church, for a thousand years. Then we know that He will deliver His kingdom up to God that God might be all in all. But listen, before that, it goes on in Revelation chapter 20, and it talks about Satan being loosed just for a little season. And he goes out and gets the armies of the north and brings them against the holy oblation, or the camp of the saints. That's a holy oblation, that 50 mile square. When he comes against that camp of the saints, fire comes down from heaven, and he's literally consumed in those that follow him. Then there in Revelation chapter 20, the last verses, it's a horrible thing. When it talks about God's great white throne judgment. When Satan, fallen angels and demons and those of the Old Testament and the New Testament that have rejected Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior will be brought before the throne of God. The book of life will be opened up. They'll be shown that their name is not there. The book of remembrance of their life and the many times they have rejected Him and what they've done against Christ will be brought up on that great day. And it said, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Friend, the sad part about that, that's you, that's me, that's our children, that's our grandchildren. Where are they going to be on that day when God speaks that great hour of judgment there? Then that concludes the 7,000 year period. John sees the earth renovated by fire. Then he sees the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride of her husband. Oh, she's decked in gold and precious stone. It's beautiful. And John sees it and the angel shows him the city. He says, this is the bride. That city is a 1,500 mile square. It's as big as the United States is from the east coast all the way in past the Mississippi River about 300 miles. All the way from Maine. All the way to the coast of Florida. Look how little New York is or Los Angeles or, or, Los, or, or, or the city of Los, the cities of, of Florida. All those cities. How little they're going to be in the vastness of that city. But it said that the kings of the earth would bring their light inside of it. The saved of the nation would walk in the light of it. But friend, you and I, as a bride of Christ, can live inside that city and be a part of His glory forever and ever and ever. He looks and sees that in Revelation 22. He sees a river of life flowing 1,500 miles down from the Mount of Congregation side of the north where God dwells inside the new Jerusalem with His bride and flows outside the gate, out inside the new earth. And it talks about the tree of life on each side. And the, the fruit that it brings forth is for the healing of the nations. And many will be in the natural body outside. Some will be in the spiritual body inside. Several years back, the angel of the Lord came to me and he took me in the millennial reign and I saw the millennial temple. And I saw Jesus standing by the wall. And there was different saints there, had on white robes. Some of them had on more gold, some had less gold, and some had uh, the final third part was less than that. And the Lord was standing there. I said, Lord, what does this mean? Because I noticed when one with a lesser amount of gold would come before another, he would prostrate himself. The Lord says, this is the three different levels of the saints. He said, some will be over ten cities, some over five cities, some over one city in the millennial reign. But he spoke to me and said these words. If you will continue to speak my word on the devil's word, you will reign over ten cities, five cities, one city. You can be with me inside this millennial temple there. Friend, that's just not for me. God has got promises for everybody that will believe Him. But He sees that new Jerusalem, the bride inside of it. 
But he goes on and says this at the end of that thing. Listen to me. He said, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that's filthy, let him be filthy still. Or be too late to change back there. But he went on to say, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. There's a difference in righteousness. Christ's blood makes you righteous. There's a difference in that in holiness, progressive righteousness in God. But he went on to say, John said, that said this, if any man add to this book, God will add to him the plagues. If any man take away from this book, God will take away his part out of the book of life. That scares me. Now I've talked about all of that glory. I want to finish up this way. Now I said John saw the, the bride of Christ inside the city. The king's earth bringing their glory into it. Save the nation walking the light of it. I wish he'd have stopped there. That's not all he saw. He saw a place called Gehenna, the lake of fire, that many would go and look over into forever and ever and ever. Same as Isaiah, the last chapter. The last chapter where the wicked will be forever and ever and ever. Friend, this is a serious thing. Where are you going to be when that new Jerusalem comes down? It's all over. Begin the new heaven and new earth. You're going to be inside the city, outside, walking the light of it, or will you be in the lake of fire? This is a serious thing. You say, Brother Larry, you speak out awful strong. I've tried to warn about Catholicism. Now listen to me carefully. There's thousands and thousands and thousands. Millions of good people inside the Catholic Church that love God. Many are dying and going to heaven every day. There's many people in, inside the 560 million that belong to the World Catholic Church there in Geneva, Switzerland. There's many inside the National Catholic Church, 45 million inside of them that's dying and going to heaven. They're good people. The friend, this thing is coming down to the mark of the beast and God, Revelation 18, it says, Come out of her, you my people, that you be not partaker of her sins, nor receiver of her plagues. This thing is coming right down to it, friend. Think about it. We're closing today. Our president, Obama, I pray for him constantly that God would call him to look unto Jesus as Savior and to walk in the light of the Word. After his inauguration, he had services in Washington, D.C. He had Muslims, Jews, Hindus, and Buddhists, and Christians in the service. That's blasphemy. Then at the National Prayer Breakfast, he brought Tony Blair over here the leader of the European Union over there. That's a great envoy now for the United States, Russia, China, and the and, and U.S. over there, envoy, envoy over there to, to Israel. He brought him in there. And Obama gave his speech that coincided with what Tony Blair had to say. All religion, religious pluralization, globalization. Obama talked about his being raised up there among the Muslims. Then his conversion to Christianity. And he went on and spoke this, that there are many paths to heaven that's blasphemy, friend. And when this beastly system comes together with well, this hearty church system, you better not be inside those churches. You better not be inside of any church that's a part of that because the mark of the beast is a religious seal. And brother, you can receive it by your intellect or giving the right hand of fellowship to it. Be careful, beware. Say, brother, are you a brave man to talk those things? No, no, I'm, I'm not a brave man. I'm a man that's afraid. Because I'm trying to preach what the Lord Jesus Christ gives me. But I fear God more than I do anything out here that might come against me. Regardless what it is, I fear God and I love Jesus. May God bless you. May this message be a blessing to you. Take time to read it. Listen to it over and over again. And be careful. The Lord's coming. We're going to be going out and preaching the Bible across this nation and around the world. If you'd like to have us come, we don't come to a place and preach the Word of God. If we've had evangelists here that... Constant take up an offering. I never mention the offering. I don't come for an offering. All we require is just our expenses. We'll never mention it because we're coming to lift up Jesus. He's coming soon. May God bless you.